Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, boys and girls. Appreciate that very much. We focus upon our Lord on this day. Where thoughts today from this gospel text are, are on uh, what, what took place on this particular Sabbath, and, uh, and also thinking about the word fame. Fame. That was the title of a movie a few years back, and, and maybe, maybe it was a, a, a Broadway production. I'm not exactly sure. But let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh God, for your convic conviction by your Holy Spirit. And I thank you even for the conviction in my own heart as I reflect myself on the application of this, of this passage. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us today, we pray. Thy word is true, sanctify us in thy truth. Amen. As we read the gospel text previously already, they, uh, we find ourselves in the town of Capernaum, which is on the north tip of the Sea of Galilee. When we were preaching earlier this summer, we were talking about how Jesus moved to the, to the Sea of Galilee to select the disciples. And so in a sense, we're kind of continuing on. Uh, one of the commentators believed that, that the disciples would have been selected, maybe even on Friday, as we move into the Sabbath day, as it says um, in verse 21 of our text. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And it was Capernaum where Jesus became to be very, very popular. We can think of the popular meteoric rise of uh, various celebrities. We're in a culture of celebrities, aren't we? And uh, perhaps you have a favorite celebrity that uh, you followed throughout your life for, for whatever reason. It might be a singer, it might be an actor, it might be a person that you respect, it might be a politician, it might be uh, any number of people. Maybe it's an athlete. Maybe you have a baseball card or a football card of, of somebody's rookie season. And you follow them through the through, through the years. One person that has been a, a notable athlete and for a Minnesota sports fan is Adrian Peterson, running back for the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, it was said of him by one of the Minneapolis uh, sports reporters that he had never seen the, the fall of a, of a person of celebrity so quickly as, as did Adrian Peterson. However, as always, we need to be careful as the judgment that we pass because things may not always be as they are reported in the media, as we know. Jesus of Nazareth received the fame and adoration of the public today, much like he did in the Bible. People respond to Jesus today much like they responded to him, and even in, even in this text. One thing you'll notice as you read through this text as we did a few minutes ago is his popularity amongst the people of Capernaum. It was almost instantaneous. And he receives that recognition as an arbiter, as an arbiter, as a tiebreaker, as someone to have on your side. He's popular at times. Everybody wants him on their side. Everybody wants him to be listening to their prayers. People put, put the little fish sign on the back of their car. People want to have Jesus around, even, even if it be a little crucifix or a trinket or something, almost as a good luck charm. Is Jesus a good luck charm for you? But Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and have done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He says that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Imagine that. All the people today that are around us, that are, that are claiming allegiance to Jesus. And there's a lot of people, a lot of different groups, and, and both political and activist and, and otherwise, that are, that are claiming loyalty to Jesus. Whether it's the fundamentalists, the, or, or whether people are railing against the fundamentalists, or whether it's the liberals, each one claims allegiance to Jesus. And which is going to be this group? 
that Jesus is addressing in Matthew 7. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, did we not? And did you catch exactly what they did? I, I've emphasized this before, and I'm not afraid to repeat it. Did we not cast out demons in your name? <coughs> That's pretty impressive. And done many wonders in your name? And then to have Jesus make the following statement that he says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But does everybody watch him? Does everybody listen to him? like the people in our text? Wouldn't you like to be in Capernaum? If you were in Capernaum, this whole passage of Scripture, if you notice, from Mark chapter 1, and we're going to be staying in Mark, or at least, well, at least I don't know what uh, Corey, Mr. Corey Barr is going to do next week as he shares, but, but next week the text continues in, in Mark chapter 1. But wouldn't you like to be in Capernaum and see all this take place? This is all reported from a third person. And in fact, we don't hear Jesus speak until he addresses this man, this, this demon in the temple. Here we have a text that is told entirely from the observer's point of view. It's almost like with a camera, you spotted the Lord on the streets of the city and watched from a distance. You watch the response of the congregation. He visits and hears that, 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 that he visits and that hears his teaching. You watch the amazing response of a man with an unclean spirit. You watch the response of the crowds on the street. You watch the response of the one he touches. All, as it were, from a distance. Well, let's look at these responses. The first of all is the response of the religious in verses 21 and 22 of our text. It says, Then he went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. Again, the third person vantage point, most likely he was invited by the rulers of the synagogue, and what is part of this text with, that we know is the people were dumbfounded, says, says the commentator Lenski. As long as Jesus spoke, every eye and every ear were fixed on him in rapt attention, dreading to miss a single word, is what, it, is what he writes. Jesus' doctrine was with authority, and notice here we see that, is that he spoke with them with authority. That's, that's what the comments of the people were. And they were astonished at his teaching. He taught them as one having authority. And then it says, and not as the scribes. Amazing. Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been amazing to hear Jesus speak? Would you have repented at Jesus' sermon? At Jesus' doctrine? Would you have responded in faith to whatever Jesus was challenging you with? It says everybody was amazed. They were absolutely dumbfounded, as the commentator said. And in fact, the commentator, who is a Greek scholar, says that, that that is what is being emphasized in the response, is the people's response was just, whoa, taken back. They were dumbfounded at what Jesus had to say in the synagogue, and then it gets better. The second response is of the, of the underworld, is the way I called it, in verses 23 to 26. This is the month of Halloween, isn't it? We have Halloween just around the corner. How many of you have your costumes already picked out? I can tell some of you do. You can see it in your eyes. Have your costume already picked out? I'm not going to, well, I'm going to betray what I'm going to. Getting to get into what kind of costume that I'm going to suggest in a bit here. We're in a month of Halloween. Unfortunately, Halloween is a time of year where, where evil is, is, I don't want to say celebrated necessarily, but, but we kind of allow that, that little crack in the door. Inside the synagogue, and this is what's so surprising. It says in our text, and I got this wrong at first, and I, I, I caught myself because I thought that this that, that, that Jesus encountered this unclean spirit outside the synagogue. But I was I was wrong because in verse 23 it says, Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he 
cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. What do you think this is? Do we have unclean spirits today? Or was this a mere primitive superstition that Jesus is accommodating himself to? Well, it says they, are, they or, or he cried out in verse 23, in the plural, let us, or verse 24, let us alone, what the, do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, so us and we. So apparently this man was possessed by multiple demons, by multiple unclean spirits, plural. And this is the only dialogue in the passage. Did you notice that? It's the only place where there's both. Well, not only one, but plural. Let us alone. It says, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? We, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. They knew who he was. They knew his identity. You know the identity of the Lord. And it's interesting that we have to learn the identity of the Son of God from the evil forces. You see, the, the people in the synagogue, the rest of the people were dumbfounded. They didn't know necessarily who he was. He could have been Jesus of Nazareth. Well, he was Jesus of Nazareth. He could have been, and they, they saw him as the son of Joseph, perhaps, if they knew uh, where he was well, from Nazareth. They knew he was from Nazareth, and now he's in Capernaum. I suppose it's about, you know, maybe 40, 50 miles away, something like that. So they probably knew where it worked. His, his family background, and, and there's some in, in the Bible and some indication in the New Testament that they knew that he was, um, they knew the circumstances in which Mary and Joseph came together, and it was thought that it was an illegitimate situation by, by the local people, the town people of the day. So the people in Capernaum knew him as Jesus of Nazareth, but the demons knew him as the Son of God. I know who you are. Isn't that interesting? Back to the question of primitive superstition. Why do they make satanic movies? Why do they make movies about people being possessed? Well, if I were to play the devil's advocate and say, that is Hollywood. It's fantasy. It's not intended to be believed. Two things to observe. See how they present the church and all of these, one common element and all of these horror flicks and horror movies is that the church is depict, depicted as dimly dark and decrepit, never a light of hope. See how they present ministers and, and, and people of the gospel, people and, and servants of the gospel. You have to search hard and long to find positive examples of church leaders and church people anywhere in Hollywood. And we seem to relish the evil. It's all fun and games, we say. But listen to the Holy Spirit, people. When you buy your costume, my advice, never glorify evil, because evil never glorifies good. Never glorify evil, because evil never pays the favor back. You look hard and long to find an example of Christian principles being held up in a positive way. Dress up as Bible characters, folks. That's my advice. Dress up as angels. Well, they knew who he was. Here's the gospel in this. Jesus has authority over evil. <coughs> he has authority over man's rules. We don't live in an arbitrary, out-of-control world. Jesus has power over darkness. The power of light causes the power of darkness to shudder. But Jesus has, has authority over evil. Jesus has power over evil. And I appreciate what Tracy said a few minutes ago in the children's sermon, is that Jesus has power. The amazed response of the crowds, it says the people were amazed, drawn to him. Verse 27, they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this, a new doctrine? What, what is this new doctrine for what authority he, he commands even the unclean spirits to obey him? And then verse 28 says, And immediately his fame spread throughout the entire region around Galilee. Jesus was sure popular in Capernaum. Jesus is popular today as well. But what difference did it make in their lives? That's the question. What difference does it make in your life? 
Is Jesus popular to you? Do you have a fish sign on the back of your car? And there's nothing wrong with that. But are you living like Jesus? Are you following him? Are you demonstrating his love and his compassion in everything that you do? And back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 24 to 28. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And by the way, this is immediately following the passage that I read before, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And then two, three verses later, he is likened a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And this is, this is the people, this is an answer to the question, to those whom the Lord is going to accept. He's like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall for its pounded upon the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and, and its great was its fall. And so, my friend, the answer to the question is, who is going to be accepted into the kingdom of heaven is going to be those who put his word into practice. The response of the healed. Go in private to the disciples in verses 29 to 31. In private with the disciples, personal need. This is a good example of not forgetting that Jesus has compassion not only on the public, but also on those within our four walls. It's easy to forget that those we share our lives with. It says in, in verses uh, 29, now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. And it says they came, they brought him, they, they brought, they told Jesus about her, and he touched her, and she, she was healed. This is a message to us, to our leaders. Let's not forget about our own. So the response. Peter's mother-in-law, as she came and encountered Jesus, was that she arose and she served. Has Jesus touched you in the same way that he touched her mother-in-law? And if Jesus has touched you, are you willing to arise and to serve? Jesus not only exercises power, but compassion. Well, what, is, what happened? What does history report, report about people in Burnham? Matthew 11, 20 to 23 tells us, sadly, <coughs> that the people in Capernaum did not fare so well. Even though they had seen all of these things, even though they had claimed Jesus is famous, Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. And a few words later, he says, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted, will you be exalted to heaven? Will be brought down to Hades, for the mighty works which were done in you, or if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for you. What will the legacy of our church and our fellowship be? What will the legacy of your Christian life be? Will that be of building your house on the rock? Taking his word and putting it into practice? Or are we building the house on the sand? Both builders heard. Both of them heard the word. But only one put it into practice. And may we be that one. Who puts it, and puts it into practice. My prayer for you all, as I look out over you as, as, as my congregation, and I say, and I say that with the greatest humility and, and honor, as I pray that God would give us all tender and sensitive hearts to not be hearers only, but to be doers. And to receive him in your life, whom to know the life is life.